Hello, everybody. Kirk Spano, Saturday, March 23rd, 2024, and second fantasy baseball draft tonight. All right, important. What have I talked about over and over and over again? It's that the Federal Reserve has a bit of a quandary. They are talking about cutting the quantitative tightening in regards to shrinking the Fed balance sheet a little bit less or a slower pace and mindful of the repo market so that it doesn't implode like it did back in September of 2019 and they had to do stealth quantitative easing. Well, I don't think the quantitative easing is going to be so stealth by next year or the year after. So first off, this is from Wolf Financial, this chart. They're rolling off $60 billion a month in treasuries. However, by next year, middle of the year in June, they don't have $60 billion to roll off on a month-to-month -month basis. So that is where they are running into some issues is that they just don't have that much debt to roll off anymore. What, what, the Fed doesn't have tons on their balance sheet? Sure. However, it's longer term, some of it. As you can see, the red lines, the red bars are all longer term and it keeps going out. And the two-year treasuries, the bills, are starting to get eaten up. And by July 2025, there'll be no more two more two-year notes left. So what does that mean? It means that, that to fund the government, they are going to have to necessarily add debt to the Fed balance sheet. I think what you're going to see is lower interest rates at the Fed funds rate so they can do two-year notes and a lower interest rate. Why is that important? And I couldn't find a real good chart. I looked for 20 minutes. Uh, Less was uh, good enough to give me this. U.S. Treasury debt by maturity. You can see that it really pops up here. I mean, this is all financial crisis debt. It really pops up here. And I don't know that this is quite right, but it, there is a pop up in U.S. Treasury debt coming starting next year. And what they're going to need is a lower interest rate to write two-year notes because the long end of the curve is stuck over 4%. And I don't know that it's going to come down too much, maybe into the threes again, but still with a trillion dollars of debt to roll pretty much every 100 to 150 days is where they're at right now. You're looking at an awful lot of interest expense. And what we just saw is that interest expenses on the U.S. debt jumped up a lot. I did not look to see if they passed the funding bill last night, but I did see that some of the details on the House side were that uh, they were flattening basically all the spending other than the Department of Defense. You know, they rejiggered some things, you know, take a little money from here to put it over there. But it was a pretty flat spending bill x the uh, military spending so what i've been telling you for a couple of years now is that we are in fact moving towards a flatter government spending curve because we know that we need money for the boomer retirement that money for the boomer retirement will come by expanding the fed balance sheet again and it starts probably next year or the year after we're very close to quantitative easing again now what does the correction look like in the meantime? And is the Fed going to be ahead in the game this time or behind? Well, they're trying to be real time. And in hindsight, turns out inflation was transitory, all the way back to under 3% again, quickly within a year and a half, two years on the outside, I guess, from peak. And that happened by just raising interest rates up to what? A high rate? No, five and a quarter percent. That is historically average. So average interest rates, average, just average interest rates have allowed them to crush inflation. And why would that be? And I discussed this on Wolf Financial on X Spaces this week. Again, the reason that inflation came down so fast is because the natural forces are deflationary. We have natural deflation from demographics coupled with disinflation from technology, even though there's a bit of a spending boom for AI right now. The net effect at the tail end of that CapEx cycle will be serious disinflation. So we know that as more AI gets deployed and we can produce more with fewer people working hours, that is an uptick in productivity, which has always been disinflationary, always. Because if we produce more with less expense, 
prices come down. The deflation from the aging demographics is because older people spend less money. Why? Because they're not earning as much. You know, they have some investments. But for the most part, you have 60 plus percent of the American population has no real retirement savings. Another 20% with what amounts to emergency money. And then only 20% that really retire with anything significant. Only 10% of the people retire with a million bucks. So you're looking at a situation where because retirees don't have a lot of money, they're not spending much. And their big expense is medical towards the last 10 years of their life. And they save for that, right? They worry, well, I don't want to run out of money. So they save money by not spending early in retirement so they can give it to the healthcare system at the end of retirement. Now, I think that's an ass backwards way of doing things. Spend your money early in retirement when you can afford it and when you can appreciate it, and when you can enjoy it. And at the end of your life, if you leave a couple bills to the government and the healthcare system, such is life. And I think more and more people are actually moving in that direction. I think that the whole save until uh, the very, very end is probably a dying thing. I don't think the boomers are doing it as much as the uh, silent and World War II generations did. I see that uh, just from having talked to people in the financial planning uh, business. So what I think we're going to see is to fill all these gaps, the Federal Reserve is going to do what the Bank of Japan did. And they're going to do it not for as long of a period because we're in a better condition than Japan was. And we just have a much, much better diversified, resilient economy than Japan does. So what we have here is a situation where the Federal Reserve necessarily in the short term has to lower rates because they have to buy a bunch of two-year treasuries again to bring down the financing costs for the government until we finally move towards a balanced budget. I think sometime in the 2030s when the millennials are at peak earning and a handful of the boomers start to die. Pretty easy equation. The roll-off of quantitative tightening, which is covered in the Wolf Street article. So I, I appeared on Wolf Financial, but this is Wolf Street. It's pretty simple. Starting in the summer of 2025 to avoid a repo market problem. And remember, they already did the standing repo facility where they renewed it to basically bail out the repo market if something goes wrong again, like it did in 2019. The Fed is going to start flattening out their holdings right? At 4.63 trillion right now, probably be down to about 4 trillion by next year, but then it's going to start ramping up and it'll ramp up slowly initially with two-year notes. However, if there's a shock and you know that they actually want a shock because during a shock, an economic shock, they can lower interest rates even further. And then if the 10 and 20 year treasuries get cheaper, say 3% or two and a half percent, they can do much longer term debt at lower interest rates. And they don't typically do that because their investors in that debt, you know, get squirrely about not getting a better rate. However, from time to time, they'll do it. In the meantime, you have all of the U.S. Treasury debt that has been bought by Americans, which is the majority of it, and by U.S. Treasury. Uh, U.S. Treasury has been bought by agencies, government agencies, and that wave goes up and down as they mature. As interest rates come down, what happens to bond values for the boomers? Bond prices go up. So I am managing a portfolio right now and consulting on a portfolio right now that has a ton of treasury debt and municipal debt. And they're not trading at par right now, a little bit below par. But when interest rates drop, they'll trade at or above par. And that'll be the spot to sell them for a capital gain. So in the meantime, you collect interest that is somehow tax advantage. Treasuries, you don't pay state taxes on. And muni municipals, you don't pay federal taxes on. And some are double uh, tax-free if they're from your state of residence. So when you take a look at all these moving parts, what you are seeing is that the quantitative tightening is close to peeling off. Uh, May might be the month. June might be the month. Hard to know which one. It has to do with tax receipts, which should be peaking right about now and into April. And they usually get those checks cashed within a week. So if a ton of checks come in, on April 15th, they have them cashed by the end of April. There's a lot of debt maturing in May, so I don't quite know how that treasury auction will work and how it plays in with the QT. I don't know if there's a little lag there where they can go one more Fed meeting without changing things, but the change is coming either start of May if they're proactive 
or in June if they're reactive. We'll we'll see how they how they decide to do it. Uh, they did talk about it this month. So you're going to see essentially the end of QT by next year. And then whenever we get pressure, you're going to get quantitative easing. So the only question really is, if the stock market gets euphoric, the Fed would probably wait a little bit to do anything, hoping to see the, pull, the, the stock market pull back a bit. The cover that they have is that with three and a half million baby boomers retiring every year for the next five, six, seven years, employment's going to stay tight. Even with 2 million immigrants in the last couple of years, it's not enough to cover even one year of the baby boomer retirement. So it's going to be hard for them to break employment. They'd really have to screw up and cause a big recession. And the only way that could really happen is if they continue to shrink the money supply, which has actually led to a depression the other four times that it happened. So the reason that they want to lower interest rates and get rid of the quantitative tightening is because they know that they have to stop with the tightening of the money supply. The money supply needs to grow again. Otherwise, you see a massive contraction. And there's really no reason for a massive contraction. People like Larry Summers or now El Arian, all these folks who talk about the economy needs to slow down, that is complete and utter bullshit. That is one of the things that Elizabeth Warren has right. There is so much of the world that needs to be rebuilt and transition to cleaner energy and find water and find more ways to grow food indoors. There's so much that we can do in transitioning the economy and bringing another billion people out of poverty. There's no reason for the economy that it has to slow down. The supply chain problems in energy and just generally have come from OPEC plus cutting back on oil supplies because there's no shortage and on, on, on bringing in product to market and China with their policies on trade. You know, they, they don't announce anything, but just suddenly ships stop moving or factories, you know, have a, an issue that they have to do maintenance on for four months. You know, the Chinese and OPEC plus have been manipulating supply chains since COVID. And that is the only reason that we've really had any inflation. People who want to blame inflation on the Fed and claim that inflation is always a monetary event, they're wrong. Monetary policy and fiscal policy are responses to the natural economy, which is driven by demographics and the shift away from poverty. So with so many people still in poverty and their middle classes you know, are basically our poor people equivalent, you have to understand that slowing the economy is just a way for people who might manipulate the financial system and benefit from manipulating the financial system to make more money on your dime, on your back, and on your sweat. So don't accept that as an idea. It is something proffered, again, by Austrian economists that everything's always cyclical. But the big secular wave is so left to right up that the idea that we need a recession is, is just a fallacy. And probably has been wrong for a very long time. So when you hear a politician or somebody say, we're all Keynesian now, it's because it's the right way to handle things. In the long run, we're all dead. So why would you not grow the economy, not shift to more sustainable ways of living, not pull more people out of poverty? Can't allow geopolitics to force you into a recession, which is what the Chinese and the Russians want. So frankly, fuck them. The Democrats seem to understand this. Republicans don't seem to understand this. I don't know that we can really even talk about the Republicans as one group anymore. I think there's really two groups. And the ignorance of economics, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, you know, I, you know, her initials are MT, Marjorie Taylor. So in my head, I was thinking somebody should do a, a campaign against her calling her empty green, right? Just empty. You know, I, I think I, I think that sounds pretty good. She's empty. She's dumb. She's a manipulator. She doesn't know anything about anything. And she just wants to stay in power. She is the cheerleader who just has to be popular. I have stronger words for her, uh, but some of them start with letters that I shouldn't use. In any case, I believe what is coming. And I think all the evidence supports it. And it doesn't matter if Trump is president because for one year at least, Powell would still be his Federal Reserve chairman because he can't force him to retire or, or leave. And I think Powell would stay as long as he could, just screw with him, or really to do the right thing, which doing the right thing is screwing with Trump. So, I mean, that that that's just where we're at. You're going to see a little looser Fed this year. 
probably a lot looser Fed next year if Biden wins, or it'll happen after a small shock. We'll see. There is a big shock that could happen if if Trump wins. And again, I told you that's how I end up owning the Brewers. You know, if if, if Trump does things the way that he says he's going to do things, you are going to get the best big short trade of your life. It'll be better than a financial crisis because it'll be easier to predict. And it'll probably be just as steep because they won't have the brains to fix it. And probably the Democrats just let them burn would be my, my guess. So keep in mind where the treasury debt is, that steering the ship towards a balanced budget or close to balanced budget is a decade-long process that involves the millennials getting to peak earnings during a period of full employment. And just put this on the back burner, I think there's a very strong possibility that you see somewhere between 10 and 25% of Social Security receipts get put into the Russell 2000 or Russell 3000 at some point. I think there's a pretty good reason, or maybe it'll be S&P indexes, Uh, because there is a profitability component and that would limit the gaming of of that. But I think there's a pretty strong possibility that we start putting a little bit of money into the stock market from the Social Security Trust Fund. I don't know what the timing of that would be, but it seems to me that given the way Bitcoin is moving and the dynamic that that has in siphoning assets away from equities, the way that private credit has been working... And if you've read the latest Apollo stuff, pretty clear that private credit is preying on the public right now and preying on small business and mid-sized businesses. So think of things that they say from the standpoint of what makes them money and so why they would say it, why they would talk their book that way. If you, if you take a look at the timelines, that means that we probably have a pretty strong stock market short term next year or two. And then there's a breather or a major collapse. Hard to know which one it'll be. And then you probably see the medicine for Social Security being to put a little bit of that money into, into, into the stock market somehow, you know, probably through mid cap and small cap in, or mid cap and large cap indexes would be my guess. So Scott says in 60 years, I've never seen so much predatory lending. And I think that is important to take into context. Shooter was a mortgage broker, (laughs) you know, going into the financial crisis. So during that time period, I had a friend who was a mortgage broker who said, just fill out this paperwork and I'll get you a $400,000 loan. And this was 20 years ago. I was like, I don't have the money to pay a $400,000 mortgage. doesn't matter. Your credit's good. Yeah, it's good. Okay. I can get you a loan. Go buy that lake house. Now, in hindsight, I think I probably would have been able to pay the mortgage. I would have got a $400,000 house on a really nice lake that is worth over a million dollars today. Maybe I should have gamed the system. Now, a lot of people did game the system and they got crushed because they couldn't you know, cover the check, uh, especially if one of the people in the household uh, lost their job. Most of the money le- lost during the financial crisis was investor money, though. There wasn't a lot of single family homes where people lived uh, as a percentage of the mortgages that got foreclosed that were actually owner occupant it was like 80, 85% people who had bought second homes or speculated on homes. Now, so if Scott's saying that he's never seen such predatory lending, uh, take that into context. And I'm, I've been saying it for a year, right? I just warned about the BDCs. The level of predatory lending is off the charts. Now, when you take a look at how that plays in the high yield, what you realize is that high yield debt is, is, is going to peak here in the next three, four years. This is the period where I think somewhere in here is where we have a major correction. Again, it does it end up being like a two-year, three-year sideways choppy market? I think that's the best case scenario. Does it end up being just an outright collapse? I think it depends on who the president is. I really truly do. I think that if Trump has to deal with this, I just think he fucks it up royally. Uh, the same way that he's had to lie about his own business and call, and he bankrupted a casino, folks. You can't bankrupt a casino. And he bankrupted a casino. I mean, that is the surest money ever. What what industry paid their rent during COVID? It was the casinos. How did Trump bankrupt the casino? He has no idea how to handle money. The king of debt, my ass. So if we get a depression, it's because Trump fucks up this era right here. And then the Democrat has to come in here, which is probably under better circumstances from the outlook. And they'd be coming in at the bottom 
So they'll look good. You know, I'm not going to anoint them a hero. I'm just saying that they look good. So whoever the next president is has to deal with a lot of debt coming due, not only publicly, but privately. And that's going to require lower interest rates. It's going to require a smart Federal Reserve. It's going to require Congress to do what they're supposed to do. And so long as the current group is almost pulling it off. If you had a slightly Democratic Senate and House with a Democratic president, and I mean slightly, I don't mean like can bust a filibuster, because once you can bust a filibuster, things get dangerous. But where the middle has to be the tie-breaking votes, you know, the, the beauty of Manchin and Cinema is even though they were bought off by their own special interests, right? Manchin was bought off by the en- energy industry, and uh, Cinema was bought off by the private equity industry. They still pulled things to the middle, even though they were dishonest about why they were doing it. You know, I mean, they're all, a lot of them are paid off. So you take a look at, okay, can we get reasonable, non-extreme solutions? I think slight majorities by the Democrats uh, and a Democratic president probably pulls it off. And that's just economically. If you have social reasons for voting Republican, hey, that's you. But this is going to be an issue along with the U.S. Treasury debt uh, that we have to think about, you know, just start to think about next year. But then, it, you know, then we have a few years of really having to deal with things. And in 2029 is the year when the last baby boomer goes on Medicare. So, you know, there are issues coming up. They're all fixable. However, it'll take some brain power. And since we know that 85% of the debt is the tax breaks from Bush and Trump, it just makes sense to undo those tax cuts. I don't think, you, you know, you can say, well, that's raising taxes, ah, but should we have lowered them in the first place? You know, that that's really what we have to think about. And if we are going to undo a lot of that, do you undo it for the, you know, people making over a million bucks a year, or do you undo it for the people making under 150? Well, you should undo it for the people making over a million bucks a year and let the people making under 150 a year keep as much as they can. That's the way I look at it. I think that's what works. I think that's what works for these numbers. And believe me, if I thought letting the 1% have trillions and more dollars was helping everybody else, I'd say, okay, fine. That's just how it works. But that's not how it works. All right. Enough with the politics mixed in with the economics. It matters. But frankly, I get tired. Here's another reason why the Fed's going to lower interest rates. GDP growth, although it's been surprisingly up, at least to some people it's surprisingly up. I've, I've been a bull all along, as you know. Some of the estimates are coming down. And even though I don't think employment will be a tremendous problem so long as we don't have a deep recession because of so many baby boomers retiring, you know, any problem would be short-lived because there are people coming into the country that want those jobs. As long as we ap- avoid deflation outright, I think we'll be okay. And the way to avoid deflation is to not let the money market, excuse me, not let the money supply shrink. So long as the money supply stops shrinking, we probably don't get deflation. All right, I'm going to actually talk about a couple other things here. Energy. I suggested that folks buy XLE uh, a while back, and it hasn't really broken out. It's been firm. It looks like the target on XLE is about 120 to 125. So these orange lines are called fair value gaps, and it's usually that's where the big money pushes things. So this jump to about low 100 seems to be pretty certain. Up here in the one teens seems to be likely and a chart pattern supports that. And I, I think it get into, you know, middle 120s to 130. We'll see. The thing about energy is that while it's stable and we need it, there is no shortage. It takes about one to two years to ramp up production in the Gulf of Mexico, which is where it's going to have to come from eventually, because we are seeing all the shale formations flatten out on production growth. Uh, the Permian will be the last one. It, hasn't flattened out yet, but everything has really flattened out. The Bakken has real minimal growth. Permian has growth, but all the other formations are basically flat at this point. Oklahoma has the problem with earthquakes. So you're taking a look at really a situation where as EVs take off, about 27, it looks like, you should have a firm oil market through the end of the decade. Now, when oil demand really does tip over sometime in the 2030s, you know, then the price of oil uh, probably comes down a lot. But between now and I'd say the end of the decade should be firm. I don't think you're going to have anything fall off a cliff unless we get the panic pumping that I've said might come. We've already seen Qatar drop out of OPEC essentially. And I think some of the African nations are going to drop out too. 
because they want to accumulate some wealth while they can. It pays for them to cheat on the OPEC agreement, which, you know, has happened historically. People cheat or countries cheat. And they're starting to buy Bitcoin with that with that oil revenue. So it used to be the petrodollar. And really, for a lot of countries, it's becoming the petro Bitcoin. And that's another reason to own Bitcoin, which we'll talk about in major markets. I'm going to talk about two stocks this week that have been consequential for us. So we finally backed up the truck. You know, we sniffed around um, Spire up in here. But we backed up the truck in here under $5 a share. So most of you, I mean, if anybody isn't profitable on Spire, it's because you, you couldn't, it's because you couldn't bring yourself to buy more down here when I did. So now the stock is up between two and a half and three times for a lot of people. It came off because they did a secondary offering. The secondary offering was at $14 and at $14 and 50 cents, but the stock dropped to 12 because of the momentum and the way that traders can impact the stock. I sold a hunk of Spire on Monday. I told you about that. I bought it back yesterday and Thursday, and I sold puts. So on accident, I got a really good trade in Spire because I was like, well, it should pull back, you know, the 15. It actually pulled all the way back to 12. So I got <laughs> on a third of my position, I, you know, I was able to take profit and then buy it back for, you know, 25, 30% less. I think that if you don't have Spire, you can sell puts. I think selling puts is going to be a really good trade here because of the high volatility. This price is basically at a bottom price. So the, the yellow uh, line is called a fair value gap. And that is basically where the institutional magnet is. So it should go back up to this blue line. And then we'll see if it breaks out to subsequent fair value marks. And again, the fair value marks are just calculations of where the institutions can pull money. So if the institutions are bullish, you pull them up. Don't always hit the last one. Just like you rarely hit the bottom one unless the company is going out of business. I still think that the upside for Spire is in this 50 to 60 range over the next five years. But as an exit strategy, once it gets to about 30, right? So now if you bought it down here around five, average cost basis of around six like me, if it goes from six to 30, you've made 500%. Sure, you could hold to try to get 60 to double your money one more time, but I think the easy money was from five to 30. So I would plan to start scaling out or writing covered calls as it approaches 30 and just in teeny tiny pieces, you know, until the momentum turns over because maybe it doesn't make it all the way to 60 or 50. But this is where you start scaling out in that last double area. It's the first 500% that you should be excited about. Ametis. Right after I did the interview with Eric McAfee, CEO Eric McAfee, two days later, there was an announcement uh, by the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services that Ametis was approved to, uh, for another $200 million of EB-5 investment credits. There's 245 people who are all putting in $800,000 right here. There was initially $4 million done about five years ago. And now you have 245 people approved from, for $800,000 of investment, which basically allows them to buy their way into the United States under this $200 million program. So there's another $196 million coming because any of these people who drop out will be replaced. I mean, it might not be a super quick process, but they're going to get $196 million out of this plan. And well, now all of a sudden people can't really say they don't have money, can they? And they haven't even monetized the IPO uh, of India yet. They haven't even monetized India yet with an IPO of that refinery, which looks like will be another $200 million, give or take. So between the EB-5 and monetizing India, that is almost all the money they need to build the SAF plant. The USDA loans are really all they need to finish up with the RNG and dairy digesters. And then the investment tax credits for the RNG basically pay off third eye. So what you are seeing here in the next two to three years is a company that has low interest rate debt because this comes in the form of a 3% loan over 20 years. 3% over 20 years. It's not bad. Three years from now, Ametis will be gushing cash, right? SAF plants approved, got the permits. You know, you still have to do the little permits as you build a thing. Okay, they come and say, yep, you did it right. You don't have to fix anything. I mean, they're past the point of needing approval permits. Now they just need the type of permit that you get on a house as you add, you know, pipes for, 
you know, the, your natural gas, and the guy comes and says, yeah, yeah, the pipes are in right. Or when the electrician comes in, yeah, yeah, the, this is all grounded, and was, these are all the right wires, it, it's good, right? They don't undo the building permit, they just say, oh, fix the thing that's not quite right. That's what they're down to. So now that they have financing from EB-5, and they're going to IPO India, it sounds like this year, and it could be next year, but it sounds like this year. I mean, they, they've really satisfied all the financing pieces of the puzzle that they need to satisfy and the investment tax credits are going to pay off the preferred shares from third eye and then all the other tax credits lcfs production tax credits um i forget what the other one's called but it's another ira tax credit you know they go to be in a refinery business that has margins like marathon to be in a refinery business that has double the margins or maybe triple the margins of marathon you, you see where their stock is at. So when you take a look at this and you play with different charting, looks like the first target here is to about eight or nine, but then the breakout would take it into the teens. And this is exactly what you've heard me say for months. During all this time period, I told you it would happen. Just you needed the squeeze and now you got it. Should get up at the six or seven pretty easily. I think eight or nine pretty easily. And I think to jump into the middle teens uh, because this will force it on. It's already at the market cap it needs to be at for Russell 2000 inclusion. It just has to hold it for a couple of months. And then the force buying from IWM, I think. I think I think Ametis is in the teens by July. I really do. So out here somewhere. If you take a look at some of the other things here, you have Elliott Wave really isn't consequential yet. It's not registering from this AI. Maybe Shooters does. This downtrend seems to be broken. It broke up above it. So now you'll get another another potential thing. Breaks through this line here. It's off to the races. So these downtrends appear to be broken. They should pivot up now from this point. And then you'll see a red line here in the next couple of weeks up like that. If I change it to weekly, I don't think it registers yet. Yeah, it doesn't register yet. I don't know that it would register on a four hour yet. Eh, not quite yet. Okay. So I think... July middle teens on a Metis because this this breakout here supports it getting onto Russell and then the Russell, you know, you get IWM inclusion. It looks like two or three million shares of the trading the last couple of days have been legitimate accumulation by somebody. The rest of it is just traders being traders, but shrinking the float by two or three million and then just covering, what was it, six or seven million shares short? I mean, that's a pretty big deal. So I would expect the squeeze to push it up to eight or nine, probably jitterbug for a while then. But then when it gets on to the IWM or the Russell 2000 inclusion list, which is April 30th, that should drive a lot of interest. You'll have a handful of institutions that try to front run it. That should push it up. And then ultimately IWM buys it. And then once it's on the Russell 2000, lots of other institutions by charter are now allowed to buy it. Right? A lot of, a lot of uh, money managers can't buy a Metis right now because they're not on the Russell 2000 and they need to be per their charter. You know, investment firms have stupid rules and, but they have to follow them because they agree to the stupid rules and because the SEC doesn't really know what they're doing uh, when it comes to investing. So there you have it. You have an inefficient situation here with asymmetric upside, very little risk. Now that they have tons of money coming in, tons of money, hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars coming in. You know, just think about that. Just really, really think about that. All right. One last thing. Bitcoin. I was pounding the table to buy it down here. People are now asking me if they should buy it up here. Look, it's a breakout. Yes, you should buy the dips on Bitcoin. This is where this particular fair value system is saying it heads to 115000 And I think that Shooter had a price well over 100000 for this cycle too. You know, and then you'll get a pullback and then it'll, it'll go up to 300,000 uh, because the emerging markets adoption of Bitcoin is undeniable at this point. Anybody who says that it's not happening just doesn't want to look and, and, and try to understand that it's happening. Uh, emerging markets are using Bitcoin as part of their currency basket and it is spreading. It's, it's starting with countries that have oil money. Qatar just did it. We know Venezuela and Argentina um, are, are doing it. Ecuador, El Salvador was just doing it because he thought it was smart. You have African nations buying it. Uh, the adoption of Bitcoin from here to here at the emerging markets, it's going to be swift. I think this happens 
Yeah, pretty quick, pretty quick by year end. So I think you probably see roughly a double in Bitcoin this year from, from these prices, not from where it was at the start of the year and the ETFs kicked in. And then next year, you have all the FOMO from the financial advisors who are being like, oh, look, it's up, you know, it's up, you know, 800%. I should probably buy it now, you know, because financial advisors know what they're doing. All right, let's call it a day and move on to the major markets with Shooter.